All right, I'll go ahead and get started and just do the intro here for the, the final minute. Um, so yeah, this talk is mainly focused around um, how supposing the future is serverless, um, what does that mean for Node.js, right? Node.js itself is, you know, comes from this background of wanting to, in a lot of ways, run JavaScript on the server side. Um, but as soon as we go ahead and take away your control of those servers, you go ahead and give up that uh, control so you don't have the chores of managing the servers anymore. What is that going to do to the Node community? What are the challenges that we've seen so far? And how can we go ahead and address them before they do too much damage? Uh, so my name is uh, Chris Anderson. Um, I'm a program manager at Microsoft. Uh, I started at Microsoft four years ago and didn't entirely imagine myself staying there for very long, just given I was a Node.js developer and I just kind of joined out of college for the sake of it was a good opportunity. Uh, started on SQL Server and my first open source contribution to like another library besides just one of my own was actually to TDS, like an open source pure JavaScript TDS implementation, which is like tabular data store protocol or something like that, which is what SQL Server uses under the covers. Um, from there, I went on to work on Azure Mobile Services and did a bunch of stuff with um, Node.js SDKs, basically, for mobile services. Uh, did some time at Azure Web Apps, just kind of helping people run their Node.js stuff on a PaaS there. And then, randomly, I got to start Azure Functions. Um, it was a cool opportunity, which basically was uh, being assigned this technology called WebJobs SDK to just kind of manage and deal with the support issues. And me and the principal dev that was on the project at the time got the crazy idea of, let's see if we can add Node.js support to this thing, because we both liked Node. Um, it was previously just a .NET thing. And uh, that kind of sucked, uh, to be honest. But it was mainly sucked because it was hard to manage. It was hard to figure out how to scale. It was hard to monitor. But the experience of writing the code against it, uh, writing code that would get triggered on random events, that was a really compelling thing to us. And so we started a six-month-long journey of pitching it to people to bring it out as a service, because if we shipped it as a service, you don't have to deal with managing all the pieces that sucked about it. Um, and so I now have to deal with all the sucky parts of running distributed event-based code and all that kind of stuff, making sure it scales properly and monitors properly. And you get to just write code, which is the nice thing. But we learned a lot of lessons from doing that, um, all the various pain points that any of our customers felt, we also felt, because we didn't have to help them with them. So that's kind of the point of this talk. So. One kind of thing to start with is, in this case, Azure Functions chose Node.js because you just had a Node.js fanboy get assigned a technology which turned into something. But if you go and look across the whole spectrum of serverless technologies, almost every single provider has started with <coughs> Node.js. And so when I kind of thought about maybe doing this talk, I was trying to think about how would I explain why that happened. That phenomenon was pretty significant to me that so many of the providers you know, given all the very varieties and um, biases that each of the providers have when you go look at, you know, who their engineers are and who their customers are, they all came out with Node.js from the very beginning. Um, and I think it comes down to two high-level pieces. One is the fact that JavaScript itself is very accessible. Lots of people have used it for front-end development, and then plenty of people have been using it for server development with Node.js. And so you can reach the widest spectrum of people by targeting JavaScript as a language for supporting on these things. Um, being able to reach out to front-end developers is also a great pool of folks for providers to, to reach out to. Uh, front-end developers would be happily be front-end or full-stack developers if they had the means to go do it without having to learn a whole new set of skills. People want to be empowered to go ahead and deliver solutions without having to rely on others to do all the work for them. And serverless offered the ability to go ahead and write just a little bit of code and connect to that database in the back end without having to worry about patching my server, scaling my server, all those pieces. It can do just a little bit of back-end code and get a lot of the value that I expect, even as a front-end developer who has limited experience with managing really large-scale back-end systems. Um, I like to joke that JavaScript is the English of programming languages. Uh, plenty of people have their opinions about whether they like it or not, but lots of people in the world speak it, and there's lots of de uh, developers out there in the world that know JavaScript. Um, you don't need to use JavaScript as your primary language uh, for folks. Um, but Everyone is generally benefited by knowing a little bit of it, especially if they're working anywhere near web development. And so it's a very, very common language for that. And importantly, it's very easy to write without Intel since it's an autocomplete. And a lot of these initial serverless offerings came out with just a portal editor, and then you can go ahead and do like a zip upload. And so a lot of people were writing code in a web browser uh, for real applications for the only time that I can actually, like, there's not very many places where that's a common activity. And here, across all of serverless, everyone started with a browser-first 
environment, and then you could go local if you wanted to. So being able to go ahead and write code without having to have IntelliSense and have the more powerful IDE tools, JavaScript is good at that kind of thing. And then we get into why Node.js specifically is great. Now, obviously, Node.js is kind of the default uh, way of running JavaScript on the server uh, side of things, but there's other ways that you could potentially do it. The reason Node.js is great is that it's lightweight. Um, the cold start for Node.js is gonna be smaller than a lot of the other platforms, just based off of how light it is to start up Node.js in the first place. Given that your server lists, sometimes you have no servers. That's just because you have no load, and so you have to start up everything kind of cold for the first time. You wanna have something which is going to be able to get started as fast as possible, and Node.js fits that bill really well. Uh, Node.js developers were already used to doing a lot of kind of lightweight services that did horizontal scaling versus people who built monoliths that did vertical scaling. And so already you had a technology and a developer base with a mindset of horizontal, cheaper commodity hardware, not necessarily going and worrying about vertical scaling. And so for something like serverless, we're getting little tiny commodity you know, slots of compute, uh, commute, uh, compute. It really just kind of went hand in hand. That kind of... Um, wasn't a different model for people who are doing Node.js. And then, uh, with, because it was scripting, there was no compilation required, so there was no CI service people had to go set up in the first place, which once again lends itself towards doing code from the portal. And then, the really nice thing here is that it runs equally on most OSs. Um, you know, lots of developers who are doing um, Node.js deploy to Linux servers, but you know, it's about 50-50 of people who are using some kind of Nix system and Windows to go ahead and do their development with Node.js. And so by choosing Node.js, you really could target the whole swath of developer you know, OSs and community in that way. So really, the summary of this thing was, it was all about Node.js has the largest set of developers that are available to go ahead and do something for the first time. If you target Node.js, you're gonna be able to go ahead and reach out to all the various corners of the world in terms of people who want to use your product at that point, especially from a past point of view. So, what does serverless do for Node.js developers? Why should Node.js developers care that you know, all the various uh, cloud providers came out there and built a service for them? I think the thing which, um, and the previous talk hit on it really well, serverless makes background processing a breeze. Uh, functions as cloud glue is actually exactly what makes all this stuff feel so magical. One of my original proposed names for Azure functions was actually uh, Azure Glue apps or Azure Glue functions or something along those lines. Fortunately, marketing was insisting on simple, so we got Azure Functions, but that's really where a lot of the magic comes in. Being able to just throw a function and make two services talk to each other, it really becomes super, super powerful. Um, I don't want to have to stand up a server just to go and make two different services integrate with each other. Having just a function to do it with a little bit of code, very simple. Um, and that kind of really gets to the, you know, some of the next points. The reason uh, that's nice is that I get to focus on business logic. Not having to manage infrastructure, not having to manage even code for managing infrastructure, and just writing, hey, when I get this message from service A, go ahead and make service B do this. That business logic, that's all that I had to write as a developer, and everything else is maintained for me by the platform. And that's really empowering. Now you've got a whole set of developers who might not know how to manage the infrastructure, able to do the same things that you know, a team that had that set of skills would be able to do before. Now, teams that might be relatively junior or just not have experience in the particular space of running large-scale cloud infrastructure don't need to develop that experience. They can just implement their business logic and go. Um, and now horizontal scaling, high scale is easier than ever because I don't have to manage the infrastructure. And, and really, I'll just talk to this, the, the last point, too. And because I don't have to think about how I'm going to organize, how I'm going to pay for the infrastructure, there's a lot of friction that goes away with thinking, okay, is this like the right decision? I'm only gonna pay for what I use in the first place. And so I don't need to go, you know, have to spend a lot of time architecting things to make sure I understand how it's all gonna work. And so what does this mean for the serverless, um, how is serverless gonna impact the Node.js community and its ecosystem? What kinds of things have I seen happen when Node.js hits something like serverless? Well, serverless is gonna bring in more developers just from the very nature that because we can now empower people to go do things that they'd have previously been able to do based off of you know, skill level or, or what have you, more people are gonna be inclined to go with Node.js. All the developers that were doing front-end stuff that now 
because they know some JavaScript, they can go ahead and write a little bit of back-end code. They're going to go ahead and start trying to trickle a little bit further back into the back-end. It starts to, I've seen some really cool frameworks out there which actually blend the front-end and the back-end development in a similar way as like Meteor.js has done, but in a way which is actually like a full Node.js server in the back-end. And there's still proper separation between the two of them. It's not you know, some of the magic that Meteor.js does. They're still getting a, a real experience with a server-type uh, programming, but it's not the full responsibility of making sure I go and patch um, uh, OpenSSH and, and avoid having my server exposed to the world. Um, one of the things that does come up, though, is cold start. And as much as uh, we as providers spend a lot of time trying to make sure your server starts up as fast as possible, there is a penalty to loading node modules. Uh, every single require statement you make is going to make a number of FS calls. And you can do a lot of things to you know, keep things nicely cached. Uh, things on those lines, but inevitably, as soon as you have to touch the file system, things are slow on the first initial loading of your function. And so it's one, th one thing that uh, package authors that want to see their packages consumed by more and more of these uh, cloud things need to make sure that they think about load time. This means maybe even bundling all of your code together in a single file as your main file when you publish it. Um, as uh, for customers who've run into issues where they wanted to use a very large package, um, of modules you know, with you know, maybe 100 different files behind the scenes. It happens more often than you'd think. Uh, they run into this issue where they've got a large FS call, and it can, it can mean seconds of extra cold start time, which obviously isn't fun for anybody. And so what I've actually done is, just because it's very easy, once you understand the entry point to any kind of code, I can go ahead and do something. Uh, this is going to be fun. Rather than go and adjust the overscan, I'm just going to go ahead and do this here. So one of the things that we've built for uh, functions, because we know the entry point for all of your uh, functions, because you tell us the entry point for your code before you can actually run it. And so we actually wrote a tool called uh, FunkPack. I can go ahead and run that on a given uh, project, and it'll actually go ahead and automatically create the proper webpack config that you need to, point at all the right things. If you want to go ahead and specify some additional webpacking configuration, you can do that, and we'll uh, inject it into our configuration. But out comes, if you look at this, here I have a bunch of functions inside of here. This is actually my test app for the, the funk pack. So it has all the various corner cases of very small functions, very large functions, and everything in between. Um, and so in this particular case, I've taken all those functions, and now I've gone ahead and created a single package for them. Uh, if I go ahead and open up an editor, we can go ahead and see there's this um, dot funk pack uh, folder here, and what happened was I code genned this folder here to go ahead and create a common entry point for all of them. Um, this isn't necessarily required to be done, it's just something that makes everyone's life easier with the way that we run things with Azure Functions. And then here I went ahead and basically run uh, Webpack on that particular entry file. And so out comes what I think is 700,000 lines of code in this particular case, because I found the largest NPM package I could and made it a require. So if you go through here, I think, what is this? Yeah, it's uh, 704,000 lines of code. Um, so, but the nice thing is, even though that sounds like a lot of code inside of a single file, it still loads in essentially the same amount of time as a single megabyte file or a single kilobyte file for Node.js. So the, the time is actually negligible for the load time. But if I were to go ahead and do a couple of tests, the um, 99th percentile for cold start for this with it unpacked can be 15 seconds or more. Uh, and then now this is going to go ahead and load in a static time because there's only a single file system call essentially under the covers. And so it's just one of those weird things that in the server world, you wouldn't begrudge yourself 15 seconds of cold start in that server because it's be running for a long period of time. And you're never going to actually have a request go to a server which is going to be cold. The server, the, your um, front ends would probably just go ahead and send them the right error ahead of time. But because in serverless, it'll create a server for you on the fly when their HTTP request comes in in the first place. It helps to think a bit more, uh, think a bit more about how your code is going to behave when it's loaded by the server in the first place. Avoiding doing database initialization is an easier thing to do than actually running a Webpack tool. But like, make sure that you actually start listening for requests and have your um, uh, module export your code before you finish your database initialization. I've seen people actually hold up and do like a synchronous start the database before they actually do the module to exports call. And they're like, why is my cold start taking a couple of seconds? Well, you're talking to a database before you actually have your function start up. And that's always going to go ahead and make things a bit slower when you get started.
And so, yeah, we've, we've done some stuff with uh, Azure Functions specifically where uh, you can click a little box and then we'll go ahead and run that Webpack tool for you automatically. So you don't even have to think about it necessarily as part of your CI system, but you can run it locally if you want to as well. Um, and theoretically, that approach has worked. I think um, I was talking with like, uh, Brian from Architect about actually having Architect do Webpack automatically for that, and that would work with the other serverless providers as well. So it's really not an a Azure-specific thing. It's just a general interesting practice for any node server, really. If you want your node server to start up as fast as possible, you should be thinking about avoiding FS calls as part of that um, startup time. And then um, the other problem that kind of impacts the Node.js uh, ecosystem, and it's kind of a weird thing for me to say as a vendor, but most serverless implementations are specific to certain vendors, and most of them, um, well, not most of them, a good, a good portion of them are not open source, and there's not as much community um, integration with those things. Um, the whole reason that I was able to get involved with Node.js and the reason that Node.js itself is such a big target for service providers to uh, hit in the first place was because of the open source community. And so this is kind of a concern for me, both as an individual of the community um, and to a lesser extent as a vendor. Um, how do we go ahead and really build a strong community around serverless and how can we justify building on the tops of the shoulders of an open source community like Node.js and not be able to give back to those things? And so that's just been something that we've taken to heart with Azure Functions. We try to open source everything that we do with Azure Functions as much as possible. There's a few pieces of legacy things here and there that we haven't been open source yet, but it's basically on our hit list for as soon as we need to redo that legacy system, we'll open source it. Um, we do this from the philosophical point of view that it's a good idea to do it in the first place, but we also do it because it's just better experience for our developers, our team. Whenever there's an issue, we don't have to go ahead and go through some support case all the time. We still have an official support thing, but it's awesome for our devs to just watch the GitHub stream as it comes in throughout the day, and we've had things where a GitHub issue is filed and we fix the same thing and push the deployment out within like the same day. Uh, and that kind of cadence really only comes from not putting the customers uh, and the devs between someone like me, who's the product manager for functions. I want everyone to have as many conversations as possible and really have this kind of open collaborative thing. Um, it's been kind of an interesting thing. We don't have like a lot of PRs coming into our uh, code from open source. It, many, it generally ends up being issues. But we have had one or two people out there in the community submitting PRs for various features that they wanted to go do that weren't high priority for us. And that was really cool. We'd like to find ways of encouraging that more but it is work to build a community as well, and so it's, it's kind of this interesting trade-off for us. Um, but really the whole pitch here is that the future is now. You just saw, fortunately there's a talk right before mine which really talks about how you, so, you know, Bustle built a full serverless application um, you know, through just some kind of nice, casual ways of, of stepping through that problem. Clearly there was issues at each step that they took, but it's fully possible to do these things. Um, it's really, time is now to start experimenting with these things, and the reason is that you'll get a lot more agility out of using serverless. You'll be able to move faster by not relying on infrastructure, and it frees up Node.js developers to really move as fast as they can write their code. Um, so that's kind of the, the whole point. The, the kind of pitch is that we should be thinking about how we can go ahead and build open communities inside of serverless as well. I really like the efforts that have come out of all the serverless tooling things like serverless framework. Um, Apex, with, which is done by TJ, is really interesting, and then Brian LaRue's architect project is really interesting. Those kinds of things give me a lot of hope that we can build that community that we, we want to see, that we should expect to see as a Node.js community. Um, and so that's, that's important. So just a big thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. If you want to learn more about what I do on Functions, you can come by the booth afterwards. I'll be hanging out over there, and you can ask me as many questions as you want to. I've got a demo of Azure Functions running locally on my Mac so I can still test and run things locally on my Mac and attaching to it from VS Code so I've got a full debugging experience. So that's just kind of a, a cool little thing that we spent a lot of time preparing for this particular one. Um, importantly, it, it all runs on a Mac, which was a lot of effort to actually go ahead and replace all the legacy pieces that didn't run on a Mac to now actually work entirely cross-platform. So it works on Linux now. It works inside of a Docker container if you want to Dockerize your function app tools if you wanted to. Um, so all that stuff's really easy to do now. And we're on 8.5.0, which is also a big deal because now I can just do async await inside of my uh, Node.js functions. So yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> so yeah, if there's any questions, I can take them now, and then I'll also be back at my booth for anyone who wants to uh, see any particular function-specific demos. But I tried to keep this as agnostic as I possibly could while still being a vendor of functions. So questions? I answered every single question during my talk. Or worse, I'm probably thinking, oh man, I didn't make anyone think about anything during my talk, and so that's even worse. 
Um, so yeah, if you have anything specific, come find me later. I'll be at the booth talking about things. I really appreciate your guys' time. I really appreciate meeting a lot of my heroes here at this conference as well. It's really just a, a great time. I love this community, so thank you. <laughs>